So today, um, the title of the presentation is Strategies to Support Anxiety. Uh, and at the beginning of the presentation, I'll talk about a little bit about what it is and then get into the strategies and what the take home messages are of this uh, presentation. Okay, so strategies to support anxiety. So before we start, uh, and I just wanna make this clear as always. So um, I'm not a licensed psychiatrist, psychologist, therapist, et cetera. Um, I've studied psychology and special education uh, and um, I'm constantly trying to learn more about anxiety. So I spend a lot of time reading about anxiety, uh, listening to podcasts about anxiety, watching videos about anxiety. So, you know, the bulk of my knowledge comes from that background, but also the time that I spend trying to learn about uh, this disorder and ways to help um, improve um, anyone who is dealing with the disorder or those who are close to anyone who is dealing with the disorder. Um, so today I, I would like to share about um, what I believe are the most important things to know about anxiety uh, and um, sorry, what are the most important things to know about anxiety in childhood and adolescence. And I also wanna make it clear that most of the information and strategies are catered towards more manageable presentations of anxiety and that it's important of course to see a mental health professional when the anxiety has become unmanageable. Um, and uh, if there's time, I'll, I'll, I have some advice on this at the end of the presentation. Uh, if I don't get to that, I'll also share uh, anything that I'm not able to share in follow-up emails to everyone who uh, is attending or want to attend the presentation. Okay, uh, so, oh, um, so what are the key take-home points of this presentation? So I'll go over this at the beginning and at the end as well. Um, key take-home points are that, number one, while there are unhelpful, unhelpful strategies that we'd like to avoid, there are plenty of helpful strategies to use instead. Uh, we're also going to learn and the importance of uh, learning and teaching about cognitive distortions. So I'll get into what those are. They're also known as negative thinking patterns or faulty thinking. And also the importance of learning and then teaching about the brain and how it works. And then also talk about how there are things that we can address right now. Okay, so a little bit at the beginning about what anxiety actually is. So what is anxiety? So anxiety is um, overestimating. So this is a type of formula that you can look at anxiety as. It's overestimating how bad something is going to be times underestimating how well you think you can cope with it. So I'll go over that again. It's overestimating how bad something is going to be times underestimating how well you think you can cope with it. And this is from a little book, very small book, actually called The Little Book of Calm. Um, so uh, a lot of times... Um, we use the term stress, anxiety, and worry interchangeably, but there are differences between those terms. Okay, so first of all, what's the difference between stress and anxiety? So both are emotional responses, both stress and anxiety are emotional responses, but stress, stress is caused by an external trigger. So this could be, so I uh, adjusted these for students. These could be short-term triggers such as an upcoming deadline, project deadline, an upcoming test or an external trigger such as a fight with a friend. So stress is caused by external triggers, while anxiety on the other hand are persistent excessive worries that don't go away even in the absence of a stressor. So even if there's an absence of an external trigger or an external stressor, there's still this persistent excessive worry. So that's a very key difference between stress and anxiety, okay? So that's stress and anxiety. How about worry and anxiety? What's the difference between those two? So here are some core differences. Worry affects the mind, while anxiety, on the other hand, affects the mind and the body. Worry is typically specific, while anxiety is typically vague. Worry is typically grounded in reality, while anxiety is typically marked by catastrophic thinking. That means thinking that's not based in reality. So worry is grounded in reality, while anxiety is typically not grounded in reality, catastrophic thinking. Worry is typically temporary, while anxiety is typically long-standing, so it lasts a long time. Worry doesn't impair function, while anxiety does impair function. And um, this is something to add at the bottom here, but worry can also be looked at as the cognitive component of anxiety. So anxiety has the three components. You can look at it uh, with the cognitive component, the behavioral component, and the uh, sorry, the emotional component, the cognitive component, and the physiological component. So you could look at worry as the cognitive component of anxiety. Okay, so that's the difference between worry and anxiety. Okay, so next slide. So let's get into what are the most common contributing factors. So what is contributing towards anxiety? We see anxiety in our child or adolescent. What could be 
some of the most common contributing factors. So um, once again, we can look at it as cognitive. There's also behavioral and physiological triggers. So cognitive triggers could include nervous apprehension, which is a cognitive process. So nervous apprehension would be being nervous about something that's yet to happen, something that's hasn't even happened yet, but being nervous about it, nervous apprehension, which is a cognitive process. And can it also, cognitive triggers can include uh, triggers uh, that are caused by specific perceptions. So this can include cognitive distortions and, um, and contributors. So specific perceptions are uh, observations we make and our feelings towards those observations, such as it's raining today and I'm upset about that. That would be a perception. The observation would be it's raining today. It's raining today is an observation, while a perception would be it's raining today and I'm upset about it. And the great thing about perceptions is that we can change our perceptions at any time. You can change your perception to it's raining today and I'm happy because I love the feeling of the rain uh, when it rains. So we can change our perceptions, but we can't change observations, okay? But that's another point. All right, so behavioral triggers are other triggers. So what are behavioral triggers? Uh, so anxious behavior causes anxiety. So this is an important behavioral trigger to be aware of, that anxious behavior causes further anxiety. So the, the most common way in which we see this is when people try to avoid what they fear. So if a person is avoiding what they fear, this is causing even further anxiety. So you can look at phobias, for example. If someone has a phobia of snakes, that's an extreme one, but if they have a, a, a phobia of snakes and they continue to avoid snakes, that's only making the anxiety worse, okay? So we can think of less extreme versions than snakes, okay? So therefore, anxiety is caused by a learning process, okay? Anxiety is caused by a learning process, all right? So you learn to have this anxiety. The more you avoid something, the more you are learning uh, to have this anxiety, okay? Uh, the next type of trigger is physiological triggers. So physiolog physiological triggers are both a component of anxiety and a trigger for further anxiety. So it's kind of a vicious cycle. Uh, people believe that the physical symptoms of anxiety that they're having, which could be uh, faster heartbeats, okay, you feel like your chest might be kind of caving in, you might have some stomach pain. Some people will believe that these physical symptoms of anxiety are a real physical illness, and then they begin to have anxiety that they have a real physical illness. And this triggers even more further anxiety. So that can be a vicious cycle that we see as well. So these are some big triggers. Now, let's look a, a bit more specifically at the cognitive triggers, okay? Specifically looking at cognitive distortions or otherwise, negative think uh, otherwise known as negative thinking patterns or faulty thinking, okay? So this is one of the biggest contributing factors to anxiety and anxious thoughts, okay? And in this slide, I'm focusing on the main uh, cognitive distortions that we see in adolescents, in teenagers, okay? So what are these um, main cognitive distortions that we see? So from this list, so there's a much longer list of all the cognitive distortions that are available, but I focus in on the most common ones that we see in, anxiety, uh, in adolescents. So the first one that we see commonly is overgeneralizing. So What's overgeneralizing? This is when we draw an overly broad and negative conclusion from a single situation. So that's overgeneralizing is when we draw an overly broad and negative conclusion from a single situation. So this could be, for example, uh, a student fails a quiz and then believes that they're a failure and they're going to fail every single other quiz for the rest of their life. Or they go to a party and, um, or a sort of a social event, and it doesn't go as well as they hope. Um, someone says something to them that bothers them, and they say, okay, every party that ever is going to exist is going to be terrible, and um, it's, it's gonna suck. So that would be overgeneralizing. Uh, catastrophizing, and you're gonna see some connections between some of these, but catastrophizing is another common one that we see, and this is when we fear the worst possible outcome, that the worst possible thing is happening. So this would be, um, I feel uh, a little pain in my throat. This means that I definitely have throat cancer um, or something along those lines. So you see a lot of cat catastrophizing with physiological uh, related symptoms. So you fear the worst possible outcome for something that really is not that big of a deal, but this is a very common cognitive distortion that we see. And remember, this is feeding the anxiety when we engage in these cognitive distortions. Uh, next common cognitive distortion we see in adolescents is mental filtering. 
So this is when we focus only on the negatives of a situation. This is very common as well. Uh, it's, for example, if a student gets 90% on a test or 90% on the quiz, that's a good score. Coming from a teacher, I see that and the student did well. 90% uh, is a good grade. However, that student only focuses on that one question that they got wrong. Uh, that would be mental filtering. Another type of mental filtering is a student um, gives a speech. So that's, that's going to be one of the examples, but they give a speech and they make one mistake in their speech, but the rest of the speech is absolutely beautiful and absolutely gorgeous speech. But after it's done, you ask them, hey, how was the speech? And they say, it was terrible. I made this one mistake and it was, it was, it was awful. Everything was terrible. So that would be mental filtering. And when you only focus on the negatives. Uh, the next type of uh, common cognitive distortion in adolescence would be mind reading. Uh, and this is when we jump to the conclusion that someone perceives us negatively. Uh, so this is, um, mind reading is it's literally what it is. It's believing that we have the ability to read other people's mind. So for example, uh, an adolescent say, might say they walk, were walking down the street and someone looked at them and they say, it's because uh, that person was looking at me because I looked really silly and what I was wearing was not uh was really not great that day and uh, there was a problem with my hair that would be mind reading uh believing that you have the ability to read another person's mind so that would be the perception oh that person was looking at me because i looked weird but the opposite of that as we talk about you can change your reception that person was looking at me because i look great <laughs> but mind readings believe we can read the minds of other people uh the last cognitive distortion that we see commonly in adolescence is all or nothing thinking uh, and this is when we view situations in black and white extremes. So we view situations either as really good or really bad. So either we're perfect or we're a complete failure. So if we don't get 100%, that's basically equal to a 0%. Um, if, yeah, uh, so it's either we're perfect or a complete failure, black or white, all or nothing. Okay, uh, and um, these cognitive distortions, the ones that are focused on here is from an amazing book, which I'll talk about at the end called Helping Your Anxious Teen. Okay, so uh, let's do a little activity together so we can make it more interactive uh, this time. So um, I'm going to have five statements here uh, that are on the left and uh, I'll, uh, we'll read them together. And then I'll, uh, I wanna give everyone about, you know, two minutes uh, to just see if they, uh, we can guess what these different types of cognitive distortions are. Um, so here are the five uh, statements. So the first statement is, I performed badly on the SAT. Uh, so the SAT is, um, it's, a, um, it's an exam you take in the United States if you'd like to apply to a university in the United States. So yeah, um, uh, I think it's an aptitude exam. I'm, I'm forgetting the right term for it. But yeah, so the SAT, so this exam you take if you would like to go to an American university. So I performed badly on the SAT, so now I won't get into college. So that's the first thing. Uh, the second statement would be, uh, by skipping a word of my speech, I made a fool of myself. Uh, this third statement would be, I will probably perform terribly at tryouts and then be cut from the team. So cut from the team is you, you would not make the team. You wouldn't be on the team. Uh, fourth statement is, if I don't get a 4.0 GPA, I will disappoint everyone and be a failure. Uh, number five is, I didn't do well in my audition, so I guess I am never going to be a good musician. So which is which type of cognitive distortion? So I'll just give you, yeah, okay, let's say about a minute to two minutes uh, to try and see if you can uh, guess what is what type of distortion. Okay, 30 more seconds, say. Sorry if you don't get enough time.
Okay, 10 seconds. I feel like I'm in one of the classes when I'm teaching. All right, three, two, one. Okay, all right, so let's look at the next slide when we reveal what the answers are. Um, so if you found it tough, uh, that's because there are some overlaps between some of them, but here are the, the right answers. So the first one was, I performed badly on the SAT, um, so now I won't get into college, okay? So this is catastrophizing. Okay, so this is when we believe the worst possible outcome is going to happen. So I didn't perform well on the SAT, okay? But that means I definitely won't get into college. That would be catastrophizing. Believe that the worst possible or a bad outcome is going to happen. An outcome that is beyond, um, beyond what would be a reasonable sort of expectation for what's going to happen. Um, the second one was by skipping a word of my speech, I made a fool of myself. Okay, so that would be an example of mental filtering, uh, which is when we only focus on the negative. So this student would be saying, I did my speech and I skipped a word, so I made a total fool of myself. But they are very possibly neglecting all the great things they did in their speech as well. Third statement was, I will probably perform terribly at tryouts and then be cut from the team. So this would be another example of catastrophizing, um, believing that the worst possible outcome is going to happen. So I did badly at the tryouts. This means I'm definitely not going to be on the team. And this would be an example of catastrophizing. The next one, this might have been one of the more uh, clear ones, but this is, if I don't get a 4.0 GPA, so that's like in the United States, uh, that would be a perfect GPA, I will disappoint everyone and be a failure. So this would be all or nothing thinking that I'm either perfect or I'm a complete failure. Uh, the fifth one, the fifth statement was, I didn't do well on my uh, audition, so I guess I'm never going to be a good musician. So this would be an example of overgeneralizing. Okay, so that's believing I did bad in one thing, that means I'm going to be doing bad in all these other things as well, in all these other areas as well. All right, so those are some examples, but yeah, if you look up um, online about cognitive distortions, you can find so many different examples of different types of cognitive distortions, what they are. So, so why are we talking about this? Why is it important? Why should we know these different cognitive distortions? Well, here's why. So what are strategies for addressing these cognitive distortions when we see them happen? When we see these cognitive distortions happen, when we hear them being said, when, which, which will happen a lot. Throughout the school day, I hear so many cognitive distortions. So what can we do when we hear them? Um, here are some things. One of the best ways that we can address anxiety, anxious thoughts that are caused by cognitive distortions is to teach about these cognitive distortions. Um, so it's to actually sit down and to go over these different types of cognitive distortions. So going over what each one is. So taking the time to say, hey, I learned about these, these things called cognitive distortions. Did you know that when we say this, this, and this, that's called something called all or nothing thinking? Did you know if we say something like this, that would be considered something uh, called mental filtering, a cognitive distortion mental filtering? So actually teaching about what these are is one of the most effective ways to address these cognitive distortions, which are one of the biggest contributors to anxiety and anxious thoughts and teach about them. So working together as a team to identify these cognitive distortions when they happen. So that's one of the most effective ways is to work together as a team. Hey, that's mental filtering. You're saying that, oh, that was some mind reading right there as well. So you can find the best way to approach it depending on the personality of your child, but teaching about them is one of the most effective ways to address them. So the first step would be learning about them and learning all the different types of what they are, the most common ways in which they're said, but then actually teaching about them, sitting down with your child, adolescent uh, child, and, and going over them and actually learning about them, what they are. Uh, one of the other very effective ways to deal with cognitive distortions is to practice set phrases for when these happen. Okay, so for when these cognitive distortions happen, Let's practice and have some set phrases prepared to use when these cognitive distortions are happening. Okay, so what are some examples of some set phrases we can use? So here are some of the ones that I like the most. There are lots, but these are the ones I think are the most interesting and effective. So the first one, and you see this one a lot, is, is um, starting off a sentence when we're engaging in cognitive distortions with the phrase, I am having the thought that, and then whatever the cognitive distortion was. So it would be, I am having the thought that uh, if I don't do well on this test, I'm going to be a complete failure. 
because these thoughts are cognitive distortions. So what it literally means is that it's not based in reality. We're distorting reality. So if we bring it back to reality and bring it back to the fact that these are just thoughts, okay? This is not reality. These are only thoughts. So by practicing the set phrase, I am having the thought that if I don't get a perfect score, I am a failure. We are reminding ourselves and we are rewiring our brain to know that these are just thoughts. These are not reality. These are just thoughts. So you can say, I am having the thought that today is a terrible day and everything is going wrong. Rather than saying, today is a terrible day and everything is going wrong. Change that to, I am having a thought that this is a terrible day and everything is going wrong because that's all it is. It's just a thought. Another way to say that is, I am noticing that. I am having a thought that today is a terrible day and everything's going wrong. Another one I like to use a lot, uh, particularly when it comes to uh, hearing students engaging in mind reading or catastrophizing, is asking them this question. So this is something you could ask them, is who told you that? Who told you that? So if they say, for example, oh, um, everyone thinks that I'm so weird and that I'm always saying strange things and that uh, you know, I'm always getting things wrong, uh, a very question, a good question to ask them after they say something like that is, who told you that? And when you ask them that question, what's their answer going to be? Uh, well, uh, their answer is likely going to be, as you were probably just uh, saying to yourself, or thinking something along the lines of, I don't know, or I'm not sure, or even sometimes if they're a little older, they're going to say, uh, myself, I told myself that. And that's a good strategy, especially for something like mind reading. Uh, another one that I like to say, a uh, set phrase is, is reminding students or reminding your child or adolescent that negative automatic thoughts are what these are. So they're also known as NATs, so N-A-Ts, which are negative automatic thoughts. So it's a sudden negative automatic thought you have about something, it's N-A-T. And the beautiful thing about N-A-T is that it also spells out not actually true. So you can sit down and say, okay, this is an N-A-T. You could say it's a NAT, but you could say it's NAT. It's a negative automatic thought, but it's also NAT, not actually true, which is typically the case. Uh, you can ask them a question. So this is a question you can ask them. Is that a perception or an observation? So to learn about what's the difference between perceptions and observations and then asking, is that an observation you just made? Something that's based in reality of fact, or is that a perception? Something that is not based in reality and not a fact and something that we have control over. Is it in our locus of control? Okay. Uh, another one is to look at anxiety, externalize anxiety, and to ask a question such as, what is crafty old anxiety telling you to think again? Um, so looking at anxiety as this thing that's outside of us, that's trying to have control, but we won't let it. And asking, what is that crafty old anxiety telling us to think again? Uh, another one I like, um, which I haven't started using with students, but I like the idea of it, is, is scheduling a specific time to worry. Sounds kind of uh, kind of bizarre or funny, but scheduling a, a specific day or a specific time of the day to worry. So you could say, for example, every Wednesday is for worrying. Say, oh, if we have a worrying thought, let's keep it and let's talk about it together on Wednesday. So if they have a worrying thought and it's on a Thursday, say, whoa, 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 it's not Wednesday, right? It's not worry Wednesday. Let's keep that for Wednesday and talk about it then. Because typically, often what might happen is that that worrying thought disappears before Wednesday comes. So that's something to look at. You, you, there's so many of these set phrases we can look at. What, what do you think will work best depending, because anxiety can present itself in so many different ways, also depending on the personality of the child or adolescent. Think about which ones might work well. Another one that I really like, oh, sorry, is sharing really good quotes. There are so many good quotes about anxiety. Uh, this one I have here is my favorite one ever about anxiety. <laughs> And it's uh, this one, which is, my life has been full of misfortunes, most of which never happened. Uh, so that's one of my favorite ones ever in regards to anxiety is, my life has been full of misfortunes, most of which never happened. So most of it meaning is just in our head and never actually happened. So most of the pain we go through is pain that was just constructed in our head and was never based in reality. Uh, and another one, another step phrase that we can use, and I'm going to go a little more into reflection in a bit, but it's saying uh, at the end of the day, when uh, if you're sitting down for dinner together or you have a chance to have a, have a conversation later in the day, is say, hey, 
let's talk about one mistake that we made today. Let's talk about one mistake we did from today and open up like that. Say, oh, here's a mistake I made about this. And to normalize making mistakes, uh, to make it, which, which, which it is. But a lot of time, uh, a trigger for anxiety is believing that we have to be perfect. And that um, if we make mistakes, for example, all or nothing thinking, we're a complete failure. So we have to share our mistakes with our children. Teachers as well, we share you know, our mistakes because we have to help our students understand that, it's, that mistakes are a good thing. And that's how we learn. So that's a set phrase that we could use. Let's talk about one mistake we did from today. Something like that. All right, so I have this slide, but I don't think I have time to go. I'm gonna share my slides with everyone. So these are like questions that you can ask to challenge cognitive distortions that I found. Okay, so let's go on. Uh, brain, we're gonna come back to this um, with hopefully enough time, uh, but I'm going to skip it for now. And uh, I, you know, I, I wanted to also mention that, you know, I, I practiced this yesterday and it, it went way over time. And these anxiety presentations, the same with ADHD. I wanted to slow down more today, but these anxiety presentations, there could easily be two or three more. And I hope to provide more in the future with more specific areas if, if people are interested. But today I'd like just to focus on the main sort of areas. Um, uh, so hopefully we have time to go back to the brain, but if not, that's something to share in the future. And I'll also share the slides. So, okay, anyways, back to the presentation. So um, here are the strategies that we'd like to avoid. Uh, and this is more focused on adolescence, but it's definitely, um, uh, applicable to childhood as well. Okay, so what are some strategies? So this is focused for teenagers, but applicable for children um, as well. So strategies to avoid. Okay, so these are things that we want to avoid. Um, the first thing that we want to avoid doing is using this phrase, stop thinking about it. Okay, so uh, we, we often, myself included, we in a situation where a, a person's engaging in anxiety, we'll say, hey, don't worry about it. Don't think about it. It's not a big deal, don't think about it. When actually this is not helpful at all. I mean, the intentions are, are in the right place, of course, um, but it's, it's not a very helpful thing to say. Uh, one way you can look at it, and this example in the book as well, is that if you tell someone to uh, not think about an, a red elephant, so say, don't think about a red elephant, don't think about it, don't think about the red elephant, then everyone right now, including myself, is thinking about a red elephant. So it's the same thing with anxiety. Don't think about it. Stop thinking about it. It's not going to be helpful in that situation, particularly when they're engaging in, in an anxious thought or an, an anxiety attack. Uh, the next thing is jumping in with advice. And this is the timing that it's uh, referring to. So jumping in with advice in the midst of an anxious thought or possibly an anxiety attack. So that's not the right time to jump in with any advice. So, oh, you know what you should do? You should do this. Uh, we should try to do this. Right when the person is in a sort of anxious thought or in a mode of anxiety, that is not the time to give advice. So I'm gonna go over next what we need to do when that happens, okay? <laughs> Excuse me. All right, the next one that we'd like to avoid is allowing avoidance of fears. So this is very important to avoid uh, doing, uh, allowing avoidance of fears, because this, this is only going to make the anxiety worse. So if you look at phobias, for example, once again, I'm, I'm trying to think of a better phobia. Um, Let's say someone has a phobia of, uh, let's say a phobia of eggs, okay? Let's say someone has a phobia of eggs. And then we, what we do is we remove every single egg from our fridge. Uh, we, um, we go to the sh uh, supermarket and then we see the egg section and then we say, oh, let's go in a different direction. Let's no, not go in that area. So this would be um, not good at all in terms of um, helping this anxiety or helping this phobia is allowing there to be avoidance of the thing that it, um, the person, the individual is afraid of. So allowing avoidance of fears is not a useful strategy uh, for anxiety, okay? So we're gonna go over next what, what, is, what it would be a useful strategy. The last one that's not a useful strategy, so a strategy we want to avoid is giving excessive reassurance. So saying, ah, everything is going to be okay. Everything's gonna be fine. So obviously a little bit of this is okay, but too much of it is not gonna be helpful for um, addressing the anxiety in an effective manner and actually making things better. So those are strategies we'd like to avoid and that some of the most common ones that we do engage in. Um, however, there are much more strategies that we'd like to use. So let's talk about those, okay? 
So what are some strategies that we would like to use? So going back to this idea of jumping in with advice and stop thinking about it, one of the most important things that we want to do as a strategy to use is to connect before we correct. So connect before we correct. So what does this mean? This means when the child or adolescent is engaging in an anxious thought or they're dealing with some kind of moment of anxiety, what we want to do in that situation before we do anything else is connect with them. Uh, so I'm going to go a little bit uh, further about this in the next slides uh, about how we can connect. But connecting means empathizing with them, uh, understanding what they're going through in that moment. So first of all, listening to them completely about what they're, what they're going through so they have a chance to actually verbalize uh, whatever they're going through in that moment, to listen to them completely, and then be able to reflect to them, connect to them. Oh, so you're feeling right now anxiety because you're upset about the grade you got and you're worrying about disappointing every single person. So connecting with how they're feeling before we engage in any type of correction of saying, this is something we could do next time, or here's a strategy we could possibly use to reduce uh, the anxiety that you're feeling right now. So before we do anything, we want to connect with them in that moment. The next thing that we'd like to do as a helpful strategy is you want to externalize the anxiety if possible and talk back to it. So this is going back to those sort of set phrases we talked about, you know, saying, oh, what is anxiety telling us to think about in this moment again? Or um, what are the thoughts that we're having right now? So external this anxiety as an external thing and not as what the person actually is, not defining who they actually are in the moment. That is just thoughts. And that's all they are. It's not reality. It's just their thoughts. So what is anxiety, crafty old anxiety telling us uh, to feel again, right? Uh, the next thing as a useful strategy we can do, and this is a very simple one, is to team up. So to be on their side. So rather than this against this, it's you and them against anxiety. So you're on a team together to battle against anxiety and anxious thoughts that might, might pop up. Say, I'm on your side. I'm on your team. What can we do together now? Uh, another next strategy that's helpful to you. So, because um, sometimes if you're giving the advice, it can be a little bit of me giving you this. So instead of that approach, it's let's find something together. What do you think would be the best thing to do? Let's do it together. Uh, the next thing is help challenge negative thinking. So we went all over that. So we know what that is, is using these set phrases, uh, identifying what the cognitive distortion is and pointing it out, labeling it and then using the right set phrases or strategies for that. Uh, the next thing we uh, might wanna use as a useful strategy is redirect problem solving. So we might wanna look at it sort of like a detective. I, I talked about this a bit in the ADHD presentation I did last time, but to look at the problem, become a problem solver. So is there a clear problem that is causing this anxiety? If it's um, lack of sleep or if it's, um, for example, we, we, we didn't have a chance to eat breakfast or something like that. Are there, is there any sort of clear problem that's causing us to feel this anxious thought now? Is there something we can do about that? Can we solve this problem somehow together? Uh, oh, sorry. Another uh, next uh, useful strategy to use is to attend to non-anxious behavior. So actually similar again to when I uh, uh, presented uh, about ADHD that we also wanna give praise for when we're seeing non-anxious behavior and not just praise, but just pointing it out when we see any behavior that is non-anxious. So if they're completely overcoming their fears or combating their fears could be in a very simple way to point that out. Say, hey, you're, you're out of bed and you're coming. I'm noticing that you're out of bed and you're, you're eager to get to school on time. It's great. Okay, let's, let's go if you're going together to school. Okay, so pointing out any sort of non-anxious behavior, attend to it. Um, not to like an issue, wow, that's amazing, but just pointing out and noticing the non-anxious behavior. Uh, Stop dancing to anxiety's tune. So this is the idea of not letting anxiety control us uh, and what we're doing. So pointing out, hey, we're not going to let anxiety take control, make us uh, miss the uh, run away from the egg aisle in the supermarket. We're not going to dance to anxiety's tune. Uh, the next one, useful strategy is encourage tolerance of uncertainty and risk. Okay, so this is promoting the sort of tolerance of taking risks of going into the unknown and going into the uncertain gradually and very gradual steps. So if you have a phobia of eggs, for example, the first gradual step would be, let's look at a picture of an egg. Uh, the next step would be, hey, let's look at a video of an egg. Uh, the next step would be is, hey, um, 
let's uh, go to the supermarket and uh, look at the egg aisle, right? So small steps. And then final step is connected to that. Let's encourage small steps towards change. Small gradual steps towards change instead of avoiding completely all of the things that make us anxious. Let's encourage very small steps toward these change because that's progress. And 1% is better than 0%. And we keep moving towards uh, our goal. Okay, so those are some of the most stra uh, useful strategies to use. Once again, a lot of this is taken from, or all of these actually, is taken from this book, Helping Your Anxious Teen. So Helping Your Anxious Teen, that should say, sorry. Uh, I have the link at the end as well, but amazing book. Um, it's got all kinds of practical strategies. I'll talk more at the end of that. Okay, so use, those are the useful strategies. All right, so uh, this is a little bit how we should talk, okay? So we talked a little bit, communicate. So what's the best way to communicate? So the best way to communicate or some of the best ways to communicate. So there's, you know, other ways to look at it, but this is talked about in this book called The Whole Brain Child by Daniel Siegel. And uh, how should we talk? So the first thing we want to do is we want to get on their level. So for example, if we're dealing with a young child, getting on their level can will also include physical level. So can we crouch down and get actually on their physical level? So if they're having a total anxious, more anxious thought, let's crouch down and be on their level. Because it can be quite physically daunting if you have an adult standing over you and everything's going to be okay. Uh, so if we can get down on the level and say, hey, what's going on? Talk to me. Okay? Um, so that's something we want to do when we communicate. Uh, first, we want to connect to their emotional state. So um, I didn't get a chance to go over the brain. Hopefully, uh, I can do that at another time. But um, we have our right brain and we left our left brain. Okay? Um, our left brain is a lot more responsible for our logical thinking, analytical thinking, while our right brain is a lot more responsible for our emotional thinking. So the first thing we want to do when we're talking is connect to the right brain reaction. So connect to the emotional brain, the right brain, the emotional. We want to connect to that brain first. So if they're dealing with a very strong, anxious thought, let's first um, connect with the emotional side of that. So, hey, what, what, what emotions are you feeling right now? What's going through your mind? What are you feeling in this moment? So connect with that first. The next thing we want to do is allow them to explain to us what has happened uh, and explaining and then verbalizing what has happened. This is what's going to engage the left brain, which is the logical and analytical brain. And it's going to give them the chance to connect their emotional thinking with their rational thinking. And that's going to completely help with easing the sort of anxiety they're feeling in that moment. So we integrate the right brain and the left brain. The next thing we want to do is we want to help the child connect with their upstairs brain. So this is something I talked about in the ADHD presentation as well, but our upstairs brain, uh, where a lot of executive function, a lot of executive functioning happens in the upstairs brain, this does not develop until the mid twenties. Um, so we want to provide opportunities for the child to reflect. So reflect on what happened, give them a chance to verbalize and reflect. So the, the lower brain is a lot more responsible for our, emotional sort of our fight and flight is located in the amygdala that's in the lower brain uh, i know we don't have time to talk about this uh, limbic system is also in the lower brain so a lot of that emotional impulsive uh thinking and emotion very strong emotions in the lower brain so we want to get engaged the upstairs brain more so it's fascinating the brain and how it's connected to anxiety uh we want to give them a chance to move while explaining their stories so if they're sitting down they're moving around let's give them a chance give them sort of a, a squeeze ball to squeeze on or some kind of way to walk around while they're telling you uh, have them uh, then once they've shared with you. So that's the first step. Once they've shared with you what they've gone through, let's try to repeat and retell what they have told us. So for example, they say today was terrible. Someone was looking at me, and then I failed the test, and everything was going terribly, terribly wrong. Say, okay, so today you were feeling very upset because the, you failed the quiz, and then you felt people were looking at you. That sounds really tough. I can understand what you're going through, even if you might not totally understand what they're going through allow them the feeling that you do understand and connect with them. You do understand what they're going through. Uh, the next thing that you would like to do in communication, discuss with them that our thoughts do not define us and talk about strategies for the next time this happens. So once they've had a chance to explain, reflect, and you've had a chance to connect with them, then we can talk about some strategies we can do for the next time this happens. And the last thing is turning implicit memories into explicit memories. We don't have enough time to talk about this today, but like I said, I, I hope to do another one in the future. So that's the kind of the key things we want to focus on when we're communicating in an anxious moment and when we're hearing these anxious thoughts. Um, this is how we, we want to try to communicate. So encouraging reflection. So reflection is something we just talked about. What are some ways we can encourage reflection? 
So we can ask questions about their day. So what are some questions we can ask about their day? So very, very often, I remember uh, for myself when I was the, an adolescent, I really didn't want to share sometimes. And, and it's tough. It's really tough to get adolescents to open up about what's going on with them. But what are some possible questions that we can ask uh, that might be useful? Um, so one of them could be, you could ask, what is something good that happened to you today? So asking them simply, hey, rather than say, hey, how was your day today? That was good. Um, saying specifically, hey, what is something good that happened to you today? Something specifically good that happened to you today is one question we could possibly ask. We can expand that a bit. We could ask, what is something bad that happened today? What's something good that happened today? What's something kind you did for someone else? Or what's something kind someone did for you? Another one, I really like this one because you can kind of turn it into a game. So you could say, hey, tell me two truths and one lie about your day to day. And I will guess which one's the lie. And you can play that game together. You could start and say, hey, I'm going to tell you two truths and one lie about my day today. So you're going to guess what's a lie. And then you get them to do that one after. And that's a good way to open up. So this will be really helpful with anxiety because we're being able to open up and express what we're going through, which is one of the hardest things when we're dealing with anxiety. Uh, you can ask questions about a fond event of the child to help them recollect and reconnect with their implicit memories. And you want to aim to give casual, so casual questions, not to intense, but targeted uh, specific questions to engage reflection. All right, so we're almost uh, near the end of time. Um, another thing we want to encourage with reflection is uh, give other strategies. So these are other strategies, sorry for encouraging reflection. One thing we might want to try to do is expand the emotional vocabulary. So let's sit down and learn about all the different emotional, uh, vocab emotion connected vocabulary words that we can use. So there's six different types of ways, uh, emotion words that we can use to describe when we're frustrated, when we're anxious, terrified, alarmed, fretful, worried, insecure, timid. And there's a very, uh, there's a difference between those two, a very minute, but there is a difference. Uh, and then Dr. Dan Siegel says, when you name it, your emotion, it's easier for you to tame it. So a lot of times we feel so much anxiety because we can't really explain what we're going through. We can't find the words. So can we help with developing the vocabulary to better express ourselves and what we're going through? Uh, encouraging journaling. Journaling can be tough, but it's one of the most effective ways to deal with anxiety is writing everything that went on in our day and writing down sort of what we went through. Uh, and yeah, so not a lot of time uh, to talk about that, but another great book where some of these ideas are from is Coping Skills for Teens Work With. Okay, so mindfulness, uh, I'm not gonna go into too much details about that. That's one of the most um, kind of useful sort of strategies to deal with anxiety. Uh, I'm not an expert on uh, mindfulness. I try it myself, it's, it's tough, but it is a very effective and proven effective way. And there's things that you can use to practice mindfulness. You can use uh, there are apps that exist like Headspace, that's an app. Calm is also an app. And you can practice, practice mindfulness together. Um, you can, I, I've tried with students as well, and uh, they really enjoy it. It really works for some people. So you can have a scheduled time of the day to sit down and do some mindfulness together. And the idea is, I mean, mindfulness is basically practice for the real thing. So can we control our thoughts so they do not control us? Uh, I wanted to do a little belly breathing. I think um, uh, maybe we can just do that and... That's the last thing we'll talk about uh, today. So this is something we're gonna do together. Uh, we're just gonna do three belly breaths and then I'm just gonna go over the resources and open up to questions. Um, so belly breathing is something that we can do. This is a strategy for when we're in the storm of anxiety, how can we calm the physiological side of it down? Uh, so belly breathing is, um, it's a type of breathing where we're breathing with our stomach. So a lot of time we're, we're saying, hey, breathe, breathe. And the breathing that takes place is happening sort of the chest is, <laughs> but that's actually not calming anything down. That's making things worse in some way. So the breathing that we want to engage in is something called belly breathing. And how it works is like this, okay? So if everyone, if you could please, if you're sitting down, uh, kind of get a bit loose and comfortable in your chair. This is best done when you're uh, lying down, so not sitting down. And what you want to do is put one hand on your belly, and put one hand on your chest. And then what you're going to do is you're gonna breathe in with your nose. So try to slow down your breathing already. Mine's going quite fast because I'm doing this presentation. Uh, but slow down your breathing. And then what you wanna do is when you breathe in, you're going to expand your belly. So you're gonna breathe all that air and expand your belly. So breathe in with your nose, okay? And we're gonna do it together. 
Uh, I could say count to three, and then we're gonna breathe in with our nose and expand our belly. Ready? One, two, three. Breathe in. Then hold the breath for five seconds. And then let it out, all the air out of your belly. And keep that exhale going. Let's try it one more time. Well, two more times. So we're going to do it again. We're going to breathe in. So we want to hold it. There's different theories on how long you should hold it. Well, let's just say we'll hold it for, for the sake of time, four seconds, you hold it. And then you exhale for, let's say, four seconds or four to eight seconds, depending on what works for you. So let's breathe in. Okay. And they breathe in that air into our belly. One, two, three, breathe in. So belly's expanded, let's hold it. One, two, three, four, and then let it out. So we're doing belly breathing um, properly. We feel our, with our hand on our stomach, expand like big and then all the air comes out. So let's do it one more time, ready? One, two, three. We hold it. And let's let it out. And that's a really nice one. Uh, you'll feel uh, even, I don't know, for me, I especially feel a lot more calm and relaxed now. And my, my breathing is slowed down. Okay, so that's where I think we have to leave it for today. Uh, I didn't have a chance to go into the, uh, the brain, but uh, that's something I could say for another presentation. Also like the small things to monitor for anxiety, such as social media use and what's healthy social media use, something very important and it's connected to anxiety, especially in adolescence. Uh, then also look at organization and how organization can be a huge contributing factor for reducing anxiety or increasing anxiety. Um, and then also I was going to talk about how the importance of physical activity, but something we all know, just having a healthy lifestyle, of course, is something that we're all aware of. Um, the, what type of nutrition would be good to look at, uh, as that can play an important role, just being healthy overall physical activity and the importance of sleep too. So I didn't have a chance to get into that. The last thing I didn't get a chance to get into is the different types of therapy that are available. There are all kinds of different therapies. I was going to go into details about cognitive behavioral therapy and acceptance and commitment therapy. So that's something to look at uh, as well. If you're interested. And then finally, just let's end with this key take home messages again. So there are lots of unhelpful strategies that we can try to avoid, but there are way more, uh, way more helpful strategies that we can use instead. Uh, we want to learn and then also teach about what the different cognitive distortions are and that exists. We want to learn and teach about the brain and how it works. Uh, if we, we can do that. And then that there are things we can address right now. And the last sort of bonus thing that I had at the end is also very important to take care of ourselves too. And that could be very helpful for our, ch uh, our children who are dealing with anxiety as well, if we're taking care of our own selves too, right? And that's uh, the last thing. So the last thing is uh, I share, and I'll share my slides so you can go over these yourself. Just really, really cool YouTube channels you can look at with lots of amazing videos. Uh, some specifically nice YouTube videos, um, a web, uh, lots, there's so many websites with resources that you can sign up for and get emails from these websites that are um, involved with anxiety. So that's really, really useful too. Some useful websites. And then some of the books that I've uh, been using to learn more about anxiety. And I shared a link with like other books as well. So the ones that I've found the most uh, helpful for learning more about anxiety, it's particularly in childhood and adolescence and some like pocket books that are like a hundred pages, really short, but super useful information too. And last thing, oh, sorry, this is one of the, <laughs> well, maybe the most important thing. So uh, I had a chance to speak with our school's counselor, uh, Ms. Uh, Emiko Kakimoto today, Ms. Kakimoto, uh, our school's counselor at, at TIPS. And she said she was, it was okay for her uh, for, to share this at the end of the presentation, that she is available was, uh, to answer your questions and be honest. So she's our uh, professional, so uh, our school's counselor and that she, she has her email. So I said, here, here is her email. And you can contact her. Uh, so I'll share these slides and you can just click on this and email her right away. And uh, with any questions you might have, you can contact her at any time. She's available to answer questions and uh, e uh, excited to answer questions. And she also wanted me to share that she's available 
uh, for sessions with parents if you would like to schedule a one-on-one -on -one session with her. And it's free uh, to do that, to um, email her contacts, schedule one-on-one -on -one, and sit down with her and talk about whatever you like to talk about. And that's free. So she said she really wanted uh, me to share that. So yes, very important. Okay, I'm sorry I went a little over time again, but not as over time as I did last time. So I'm quite <laughs> happy about that. And uh, now I'm gonna open up the last bit uh, for questions. We can go maybe a, a little over time and any questions that aren't uh, able to get asked, um, you can also just email me uh, directly and I'll try my best to answer them. Uh, I'll do my best to answer questions. I'm not sure how to answer it. I'll for sure follow up in the email and do some research about whatever your question is so I can answer it to the best way I can. Okay, that's all from me. Uh, so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now. And now I think I can, you can see me again. Uh, so uh, yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, I think there's about like seven, eight minutes left. We can go a little bit, maybe over time. I'm sure everyone like to go somewhere as well. So, but uh, any questions you might have, you can, um, uh, I think the system was, uh, you can, uh, uh, I'm forgetting now, I'm sorry. Um, right. Uh, Write it down in the comment. Yeah, yeah, write down in the comments, I have a question, and then you can turn on your mic and ask the question. So you just write as a comment, I have a question in the comment section. You can see it on the right. I have a question, and then you can turn on your mic and ask a microphone and ask the question. And we'll try to do it in the order of people that asked. Oh, and, and any comments as well, too. Thank you. Uh, please, any comments, because this is a chance for parents to also share with each other. Uh, in sort of this space to share their experience. So uh, Mr. Lang is sharing that uh, they learned about uh, uh, in therapy about black and white thinking and catastrophizing and helped a lot, not just for our daughter, uh, but for parents too. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree uh, with how helpful it can be for, for anyone, for, for myself as well. The first time I learned about it, I was like, wow, there's actual, there's words for this. There's actual terms uh, that describe what, what has been going on in my head sometimes. And I think lots of people go through these thoughts as well. So it's, it's a super, super powerful way to uh, address and deal with anxiety. Thanks so much, Mr. Lang. It, it, I mean, if there, there's uh, no questions, I mean, I, I can also try to quickly go over the stuff with the brain. Uh, we have five minutes. Uh, I mean, sometimes it's hard just on the spot. Actually, it's a, a useful thing to say is, what are your questions rather than do you have any questions? So what are your questions? Uh, but I, I can, uh, if you, if you want to just write in the comment, please talk about the brain. I can talk about the brain for five minutes, but, uh, if you have a question to write in the comments, I have a question and I'll try to answer it. Or you can write a comment saying, please talk about the brain or please talk about social media. I didn't have a chance to talk about social media or please talk about, um, I'm forgetting the last thing I didn't have a chance to talk about. Um, oh, excuse me. Um, yeah, nobody's yes. asking a question. I don't know how to use write a comment. So oh. I'll, just, I'll just say something. Yeah, no uh, worries. I'll, just a second. Uh -huh. Excuse me. Um, yeah. Uh, basically, what you've talked about is cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, okay. I think so. CBT is, um, you know, it's another, there are a whole set of books there too. But mm. something that's really geared towards adolescence is great. I think this book sounds great. Um, uh, something else that I thought was interesting, the belly, the belly breathing, mm. um, if you do Zazen, you also use your diaphragm to breathe. Mm. Um, in J so we're in Japan. That's, that's, that's good to keep in mind, I think. Mm. Mm. Um, and, uh, you can do like the simplest koan is just to say, you can count your breaths, say, or you can, um, you know, in, in Japanese, you say nothing, <laughs> mm, 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 mm. like mu or mu. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Japanese. yeah. Um, and uh, also the, the, the metacognition, I mean, the sort of putting yourself outside of yourself and making yourself the third person mm. looking at what's going on inside mm. is like a really, really powerful idea <laughs> yeah uh, yeah yeah and that, that was very good to talk about that's like really central mm. I, I, mean, I think yeah yeah thank you so much that was the thing yeah, that we just uh the mindfulness is something that i didn't have a chance to 
to go over, but there is so much about mindfulness now. There's so much research on mindfulness, so many videos about mindfulness, so, so much about mindfulness. I mean, if you just type in mindfulness into YouTube and see there's so many different approaches to mindfulness and it's, yeah, it's remarkably effective uh, um, when, when, you know, when it's, it's learned and yeah, it's uh, mindfulness is for sure one of the best strategies for dealing with anxiety. There's so much to learn about it out there. So yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't have so much time to talk about that, uh, but that's, yeah, a really good point as well. The counting the breaths. Uh, yeah. The belly breathing and counting breaths. Uh, yeah. Uh, really, really effective. Thanks. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, it was a very good talk. I, I was excited. I was very interested and oh. I had lots of things and I'll, I'll figure out how to leave a comment next time. So I don't interrupt you. <laughs> no, no, it wasn't an interruption. That was really, really helpful. Thanks so much, Mr. Klein. Thank you. Okay. Uh, all right. Oh, Mr. Pipe wrote that I found that focusing on breathing stops you thinking about anything else. And so reduces stress. Yeah, completely. So yeah, so focusing on something physical that we're doing, something that's objective, uh, our breathing itself. Um, you know, there's some other types of mindfulness as well, where we look at, we try to identify what are five things in the room that we can see, four things that we can hear, three things that we can smell, two things we can taste, and one thing we can, uh, I, I can't remember the order, but that's another thing, focus on sort of objective, physical uh, things in the environment well, right? that we have control over, right? Our breathing is something that we can have control over. Sorry, someone was saying something. Yeah, it's me, um, uh, uh, Jason. Um, well, I did in a teacher's workshop and what was interesting is if you really physically concentrate on your breathing, you cannot think of anything else at all. Mm. It's, it's just impossible, mm. actually. Mm. So well, because you can't think of anything else, it reduces the stress. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And the belly breathing is, I think, a key difference that like to focus on the right type of breathing when we're engaging because the belly breathing is something, uh, yeah, that feels really, really nice. And yeah, thank, thank you, Mr. Pipe, for sharing that. Mm. Okay. Uh, so uh, I guess, so we're at the time. Uh, so, and, you know, like I said, uh, uh, I'm going to share these, I'll send these slides to everyone. Uh, and if you have, if you think of any questions, like after the presentation, you want to, uh, please uh, just, yeah, reach out and I'll do my best to try and answer them. Uh, and like I said, if you'd like to, uh, you know, um, give some feedback and presentation, add some thoughts. Uh, and if you, if you, if you'd like to have uh, more presentation in the future, I'm, there's so much material that I, I wasn't able to include in this. Uh, also for ADHD, there's a lot of stuff. I, I, oh, I, I added too much information and, I think more specific ones I'd be happy to do in the future as well. Also on other topics as well. Uh, if it's helpful for people, then I, I'd love to keep doing it. So thank, yeah, thank you so much for, yeah, if you, if you let me know and if you like to, if there's something specific you'd like to hear about uh, in connection to anxiety or in connection to ADHD or anything else in the future, I'll, I'll see, try my best to do more presentations in the future. This is probably the last one of this school year. I'm going to do some more reading and self research over the summer. And then I plan to do maybe a few next year as well. So if, if, if people are finding helpful, I, I'd love to keep doing it. Um, yeah. Oh, thank you, Misato. Thank you. Uh, and I guess that's, that's the time uh, for, for everyone. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, thank you everyone. And uh, just please reach out with anything and uh, oh, thank you. And yeah, have a great weekend, everybody. Uh, see you next time. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you.